Episode 211 The Master Coming Out of Seclusion At the same time, on the estate in Austria, after dealing with his business, Christopher called Sergeant Baldwin over. Mr. Clark. After his time in the limelight during the year-end assessment, Sergeant Baldwin had already been successfully promoted to the Law Enforcement Division. He was now leading a team with Corporal Lance. He wore a captain's jacket and also had the same communicator as Marvin, the one that had triggered other people's jealousy. When Christopher saw him approaching, he put down the pen in his hand and squinted slightly. Captain Baldwin, you should know that Miss Miller just left the estate today. Yes, Miss Miller went to send Mr. Brown off. Captain Baldwin replied respectfully. Hearing this, Christopher shook his head. Miss Miller will be staying at the airfield for a few months to settle some things. She will then return to America. Captain Baldwin was completely stunned. You've been following Miss Miller this whole month. Christopher pondered for a moment and then said solemnly, If you're willing, I can directly remove your traces on the estate. Starting today, you can follow Miss Miller. Are you will? Mr. Clark, of course I'm willing. Captain Baldwin interrupted excitedly, without hesitation. Following Bessie was akin to following Michael. Most importantly, Bessie would cover for him. Other than Marvin, nobody else on the estate, not even Christopher, could reach such a pinnacle. Christopher was speechless. He wanted to take his words back now. After a long pause, Captain Baldwin couldn't help but look up apprehensively. Mr. Clark, I... Can I still go? Christopher threw his documents to him expressionlessly and swore for the first time. Get lost. Bessie's room was the first one at the end of the corridor, while the second room belonged to Michael. Marvin now stayed in the third room. The next day, early in the morning, Marvin waited at Bessie's door. She came out of her room, yawning. Then she passed the flower pot to him. Marvin took it and hugged it in his arms. After more than a month, the flowers had withered long ago, and there were no more seeds. These days, even the leaves seemed a little withered. Marvin carried it to the greenhouse on the fourth floor. Outside was a layer of glass that would change color with the sun's temperature at any given time. It was now midwinter, so the glass was currently transparent. He put the flowers on a shelf and sent a picture to Mary to ask her what to do with it. Since it was the holidays, Mary spent her days playing games with Paul, Bessie, and the others. She was still sleeping at this time, so naturally she didn't reply. Marvin waited for a long time and still didn't receive a reply. So he took out the gardening tools from his backpack and routinely took care of the flowers before going to find Bessie and the others. Downstairs, Mason was deciding who from the technical department to appoint. There were many talents in the technical department. He had thought long and hard about it last night and had decided on two candidates. General Taylor stood patiently beside Mason and listened to him giving instructions. Are you sure about these two people? They are the two most powerful IT technicians in the department. Mason replied respectfully. They can be used by Miss Miller. To avoid any collisions, General Taylor had already notified everyone that she would be staying here for a few months. Hearing this, he nodded. Let's go upstairs. The boss and Bessie are still waiting for us in the restaurant. The two young technicians followed Mason, exchanging glances. One of them opened his mouth and whispered to Mason, Sir, the internal procedures of our building haven't been completed yet. The procedures on the fourth floor have already been withdrawn. Why are we going there now? Only a few senior managers knew that Bessie wanted to do IT stuff on the fourth floor. Mason explained the situation to them in a low voice. Miss Miller wants to do IT? The young man scratched his head. But shouldn't she call more people for this kind of thing? Two of us aren't enough. Furthermore, what can we even do there? There were usually at least ten people on a team. Mason's words weren't convincing at all. We might have to teach Miss Miller some stuff later on. Mason carefully said. The group of four people was already on the elevator. General Taylor pressed the fourth floor button directly. The fourth floor needed a separate elevator and didn't stop in the middle, so it arrived there very fast. 
General Taylor got off the elevator first, while Mason and the two young men followed closely behind him. We'll soon see the boss and Miss Miller. Pay close attention. The two young men nodded frantically, indicating that they would perform well. Marvin had just arrived at the restaurant. He bit off a piece of bread while checking his phone for Mary's reply. Bessie had finished her meal and was leaning back in her chair while drinking milk from a straw. Michael sat beside her, talking seriously to her. General Taylor and Mason stopped five steps away from the table and bowed very respectfully. Sir, Miss Miller, Mason and the technicians have arrived. They had already seen Mason yesterday, but didn't know the two technicians. The two young men introduced themselves. Glancing at them, Michael nodded and then turned to Bessie. Will these two do? Captain Baldwin would arrive today, but neither he nor Marvin knew anything about IT. That was why Michael wanted to find two professionals for her. Putting down her glass of milk, Bessie glanced at them with a finger on her chin and nodded. Two is enough. Mason finally sighed in relief after receiving Bessie's approval. Miss Miller, are the computers on the fourth floor all right? Bessie shook her head. The drive isn't enough and the calculation speed isn't up to my requirements either. The computer model used by the airfield was already the world's best computer. After all, they had to calculate huge amounts of data every day. The two young technicians exchanged glances and began to worry. Did Bessie understand computers? If these computers couldn't match up to her requirements, what computer would she take a fancy to? Mason said in a timely manner. Miss Miller, there's an S5 computer in the office downstairs. We already prepared it last night. If you need it, we can get it for you any time. The S5 computer's database was huge, and its calculation speed was the fastest amongst the computers in the existing field. Bessie shook her head. There's no need. Mason froze. Then what can I do? The other computers couldn't meet her requirements. She was about to say something when her phone rang. She picked up directly. Hello? You're here. Okay, I'll go downstairs. Michael stood up and glanced at her. They're here? Yeah. Bessie reached out to grab her coat and put it on. Michael waited for her before walking over to the elevator. Let's go downstairs then. Marvin immediately followed behind them with a piece of bread. General Taylor, Mason, and the two young technicians couldn't understand this swift movement. They exchanged glances and followed them downstairs. Five minutes later, they followed them to the gate. The two young men couldn't help but lower their voices and ask in confusion, Sir, why are the boss and Miss Miller coming over here? As soon as they finished speaking, a minivan stopped in front of them. Soon, a middle-aged man got out of the minivan. He walked over to Bessie and greeted her respectfully. Miss Miller. Then... He took the keys and went to the back of the van. He opened the loading compartment and revealed two rows of cardboard boxes. Michael stood there, scanning the boxes. Then he turned to Marvin and Mason. Bring these boxes to the fourth floor. The boxes were a little heavy, but they weren't a problem for Marvin now. He could carry two of them at once. But he was afraid of spoiling Bessie's things, so he didn't dare to do so. He carefully picked up one box to take to the fourth floor. Bessie led the middle-aged man to one side and said something to him. Mason and the two technicians knew that Marvin always followed Bessie, so they followed behind him closely. On the fourth floor, Marvin put down the box carefully. The other three also relaxed after seeing his movements. Marvin, what's in Miss Miller's box? Mason weighed the box and couldn't help but ask. He knew the boxes belonged to Bessie, not because of her phone call, but because of the symbol on the truck at the airfield just now. Hearing this, Marvin shook his head and remained silent. He didn't know, but according to his experience, it was not ordinary. General Taylor found a few young men and ordered them to move the remaining boxes over. Do we need to move the three S5 computers in the office on the first floor too? After moving the boxes, General Taylor told the young men to go downstairs first. He remembered Christopher mentioning that Bessie didn't like to stay in a crowd for too long. This was also why Michael had arranged the fourth floor for her, 
Miss Miller said there was no need, but I'll ask again. Mason frowned. Bessie had said the computers on the fourth floor wouldn't do, but she had rejected the S5 computers too. She came up to the fourth floor with Michael just as Mason finished speaking. Walking one step behind Michael, her eyes were lowered slightly and she was on a phone call with someone. Michael glanced at the others, who were silent again and couldn't help but raise his chin. What is it? Mason glanced in Bessie's direction and lowered his voice. Erm, Ms. Miller said that the computers wouldn't do, so we don't have to bring the S5 computers up. Michael shook his head. There's no need. Open the boxes first. Hearing this, Marvin turned around and took a pair of scissors from the table to open the box. The first box revealed an assembly set, a computer display screen, and a server. They were all black. Pulling the foam and protective film aside, Marvin squatted by the black display screen for a long time, feeling a sense of familiarity. He thought about it and squinted his eyes for a while before he remembered why it was so familiar. This computer looked like the row of computers in Daniel's house, but it wasn't identical. It was probably a different product of the same brand. Marvin wasn't knowledgeable about computers, But since Samuel had wanted to take the computer away at that time, he had guessed that the computer's quality was probably very good. Episode 212 The Pinnacle of Life After all, Samuel was a gamer and had a computer specially configured for himself. Marvin went to open the second box. Behind him, the curious Mason and the two young men finally saw the contents of the box. Even Mason couldn't help but look stunned. The two young men froze. What the fuck? Unlike Marvin, these three people were very knowledgeable about computers. They immediately recognized which company the computer product was from and dared not to speak for a while. They just helped Marvin move the ten sets of computers to the studio quickly. Marvin didn't dare to touch the other parts so only Mason and the others dared to assemble the parts in silence. Bessie was still on the phone outside. General Taylor didn't know these things either and followed them in. There are other things to deal with at the airfield. Do you want the three S5s in the office on the first floor? He glanced outside before lowering his voice and speaking in a whisper. No. Mason quickly installed a computer. After plugging in the power, he pressed the switch and the computer lights lit up. The screen page skipped past a streamlined logo of the World Poker Tour before arriving at the home page. Mason quickly hit a few shortcut keys on the keyboard. Information such as the processor of the model suddenly popped up. When the two young men saw this, they excitedly squeezed past Mason to stare intently at it. Mason couldn't help but turn to look at Marvin, who was unable to get a sense of the matter. Since Michael and the others were still here, Mason only looked at it for two minutes before looking away reluctantly. He then turned to Marvin and General Taylor with an excited expression. No wonder Miss Miller doesn't need our computer. This is a much better processor. It's from the World Poker Tour. Although I don't know the specific model, it has the processing speed of at least twice as fast as that of the S5. The S5's speed was fast enough and was recognized on the market as the computer with the fastest processing and response speed. But how much faster was a computer twice as fast as that? General Taylor didn't understand these things, but seeing how excited Mason and the others were, he knew that these computers weren't simple and were much better than the three S5s in the building. He was a little surprised at this point. Mason had already composed himself and was assembling the other computers. However, upon closer inspection, his fingers were trembling slightly. Marvin was accustomed to such surprises and just looked down at his phone. Mary had already replied to him. He would have to change to a new flower pot. Her lips couldn't help but twitch slightly. He had to change the goddamn flower to a new pot. Thinking about it, he asked Mary to bring the new flower pot to Samuel in the school doctor's office. Samuel would then arrange the follow-up. When Bessie returned from her call, five rows of computers had already been installed in the small studio. She walked over to one set and squinted. Then she pointed to three sets and smiled at Mason and the others. When you leave tonight, each of you can take one of these computers with you. 
Bessie always had her plans. Ever since she agreed with Alandro about the internal affairs of the World Poker Tour, she had already made her plans. Neither artificial intelligence nor the EA series robots were generalized. The core of the technology was in her hands. Mass producing large quantities would depend on her. Without waiting for them to recover from their shock, she went back to her room and took out her cell phone from her backpack. Her phone lit up by itself. Then, slowly, she sent a long list of codes to Bessie's laptop. She took her laptop and went to the studio. The system is too cumbersome, so I might not be able to deal with it in just a few months by myself. She sat down on an empty table and turned on the computer. The computer page was still blank. It wasn't a desert color this time, but an ocean color, vast and boundless. After pressing a few keys, an encrypted file popped up directly. I'll send these to all the computers first. These computers will process the data. Then, we will have to add new algorithms. She was always serious and rigorous when down to business, and her usual laziness was gone. Michael leaned against the door and watched her. General Taylor was one step behind him, looking into the studio suspiciously. Ten minutes later, Bessie finished giving out instructions. Mason and the others touched their hearts and reached out to wipe their faces. That's all you need to deal with for the time being. Bessie glanced at the computer in the office. It has already started computing. This is the smart code. I understand, Miss Miller. Mason nodded solemnly. The other two also recovered and glanced faintly at Mason. Didn't he say that they were here to teach Bessie? Mason also smirked slightly. He didn't dare to say anything about these two young technicians, because even he couldn't conceal his shock. They had only intended on riding on Bessie's coattails at the beginning, but now, after seeing the codes and series of things arranged by Bessie, they realized with euphoria that they had indeed followed the right person. After that, Mason and the others lived and ate in the studio. It was the 31st of May in Chicago, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The temperature in Chicago in May wasn't too high, but due to the strong sunlight above, a set of long sleeves and pants were enough clothing. It was the end of May and the beginning of June. There were already places on the road bearing final exams, banners, especially outside the gates of Chicago's various high schools. It was Friday. Miss Wallace, Bessie's English teacher, came into the office at Brightbow High School with her textbooks. She hesitated for a moment before looking at Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott, has Bessie still not returned to school? At the mention of this, the other teachers in the office all turned to stare at Mr. Scott, waiting for his reply. Miss Wallace, in particular, stared intently at him. Bessie was admittedly very clever but she had taken an unprecedented leave of more than seven months in one go. Everyone knew that the brain was forgetful. Even high school students who hadn't touched their books for three months would forget about the tangent equation of the eclipse. Although she had contacted Mr. Scott after dropping out of school, she hadn't mentioned when she would be returning. Mr. Scott put down the pen in his hand and was about to say something. Suddenly, his phone, which was lying on the table, rang. Mr. Scott put down the pen in his hand and glanced at it. His movements were lazy and slow, as usual. When others mentioned Bessie, he just smiled without a word. But when he saw the name displayed on the screen of his cell phone, he was stunned. He quickly picked up the phone, pushed back his stool, stood up and walked outside. Are you back in Chicago? His voice also suddenly became gentle. Mr. Scott went to the teacher's lounge to answer his phone, and the other teachers in the room turned to look at each other. In the end, the physics teacher glanced at Miss Wallace and asked hesitantly, What Mr. Scott just said, is Bessie back? Miss Wallace shook her head, unsure. It was indeed Bessie who called Mr. Scott. She was now at the Chicago airport, having just gotten off the plane. She was wearing a red and white checkered shirt, with her cuffs slightly rolled up, sitting on the suitcase, with Michael pushing the suitcase single-handedly. Captain Baldwin followed behind them, looking around in awe and curiosity about everything in Chicago. Marvin had gone outside to pick up the car first. Mr. Scott, 
I will come back to school on Monday. Bessie stretched out her hand and pressed the cap on her head down, revealing only half of her jade-like, flawless face. Mr. Scott stood in the hallway holding his cell phone in one hand and resting his other hand on the handrail. He looked at the incoming teachers and students with joy. That's good. I have all your documents sorted out. After a pause, Mr. Scott asked again, Are you lagging in the course? No, Bessie smiled. I've been studying with a tutor. Bessie always knew what to do. Hearing what she said, Mr. Scott was completely relieved. That's great. You've always had your ideas. I won't say much. When you come to school in a few days, there are some things that you will need to complete. After chatting with Bessie for a bit longer, he ended the call. Mr. Scott looked at the screen, showing the call had, pondered it for a while, then turned to the address book, clicked on Principal White's number, and sent a message to him. Going back to the office, Mr. Scott felt relaxed. The other teachers had been paying attention to Mr. Scott's demeanor and movements. Although Mrs. Lewis was putting away some books, the corner of her eyes were also fixed on Mr. Scott's direction. Miss Wallace, who taught the English class, had always had a good relationship with Mr. Scott. She put down the papers in her hands and asked curiously, Mr. Scott, was that Bessie just now? Mr. Scott nodded and smiled. It was her. She just returned to Chicago today. She will come to complete the college entrance examination procedures in two days. Hearing this, Miss Wallace couldn't help but let out a sigh of relief. Bessie had dropped out of school for nearly eight months. In the beginning, the teachers were very relaxed, but later on, they all began to worry about whether Bessie could keep up with her courses. Because she had been suspended from school before, they did not know if she could catch up for the final exam. Now that Mr. Scott had said she was back, Miss Wallace could let go of her worry. Mrs. Lewis finished sorting out the books in her hands. Seeing that both Miss Wallace and Mr. Scott were beaming, she couldn't help but purse her lips. She hasn't come to school for more than seven months. Who knows if her academics are ruined? The next class was Mr. Scott's math class. Mr. Scott picked up a paper, hearing Mrs. Lewis's words. He only smiled and ignored her and went upstairs with his hands behind his back, humming a soft tune. After he left, the other teachers in the office looked at each other. I don't know about the other students, but Bessie, she's different from the others. The physics teacher smiled and leaned back in his chair, still holding his thermos. She has a plan for her own life. Mrs. Lewis was quick to speak, and everyone knew that Bessie's academic performance was very good. It was just that Bessie's leave was more than seven months long. That was rare. As finals drew closer and closer, more and more people in the school were discussing Bessie. Some people suspected that Bessie would rush back to school for finals in the nick of time. Now that they finally got the news from Mr. Scott, the other teachers in the office glanced at each other. Charles Wheeler High School and Brightbow High School were neck and neck. The two schools were almost evenly matched in the examination results from previous years. Episode 213, Final Exams Many people had speculated about Bessie's news before, and a lot of false news had been spread. Some people said that Bessie had left to study abroad, and some said that she wouldn't take finals. Now that they got a credible answer from Mr. Scott that Bessie had returned, the rankings among the famous high schools in Chicago were about to change again. For Kenneth, Scarlett, and the several other top students in Brightbow High School, now that the dark horse Bessie was back, this year's final exams would be much more interesting than before. At the same time, on Chicago Airport Avenue, Marvin was driving in the driver's seat and Captain Baldwin was beside him. The car did not drive in the direction of the villa in the center of Chicago, but drove directly to the cemetery. Bessie went to see Bertha's grave first. On the way there, Marvin had stopped the car at a flower shop, and she went in with Michael to buy a bunch of flowers. Twenty minutes later, the car stopped by the gate of the cemetery. Neither Captain Baldwin nor Marvin got out. When Michael and Bessie entered the gate of the cemetery, 
Captain Baldwin lowered his voice and asked Marvin, Whose grave is Boss and Miss Miller visiting? They would be working together in the future, so Marvin did not conceal it. He explained Bertha's matter a little bit. Then he said in a deep voice, This matter affects Bessie deeply. This is why Michael took her to Austria. Know the consequences. Don't mention it in front of her. For more than seven months in Austria, while Bessie was researching the popularization of artificial intelligence, Marvin had often been taken out by Michael and others to practice, and now he had a calm and clear aura. Compared to half a year ago, some substantial changes had taken place. Hearing Marvin's words, Captain Baldwin solemnly nodded. I got it. Marvin nodded and wanted to say something else, but the phone in his pocket rang, and he looked down. The message was sent by Sherry, asking for his whereabouts. If this were six months ago, Marvin would have been ecstatic to see a message from Sherry. After all, Sherry was his idol. But now, Marvin frowned and did not reply. Bessie and Michael did not stay in front of Bertha's headstone for a long time. The two of them sat for half an hour. Bessie sat in front of the headstone and talked about her experience in Austria in detail before standing up and patting the dirt and dust off her clothes. Let's go. She lowered her head and slowly rolled up her sleeves. Michael was sitting on the ground with her, but when he saw her standing up, he did not immediately get up. He reached out to arrange the flowers in front of Bertha's headstone before raising his head and looking at Bessie's expression. Her eyes were very dark, but not as bloody as they were six months ago. He finally stood up. Let's go back. During Michael's time in Austria, Simons had returned to Chicago. Once Michael and Bessie set their plans to return to Chicago, Simons returned to the villa two days before them. While they were away, the villa was always cleaned by part-time workers. When Simons returned, he brought a few people back and revamped the villa inside and out. The whole villa looked almost the same as before Michael and the others left. Mr. Clark, Miss Miller. Simons greeted them. He had prepared a meal. After letting them sit down at the dinner table, he pushed the reading glasses up the bridge of his nose and pulled out a small book from his jacket pocket. After turning a few pages, he put his hand against the reading glasses and looked at Bessie. Miss Miller, while you were in Austria, did you listen to your tutor during classes? Bessie held her fork, lowered her head and said lightly, Yes. Simons glanced at Bessie and felt that her answer did not seem right. After Bessie finished eating, he thought for a while, then took out his cell phone and sent a few words to the tutors. He then politely smiled. The several tutors almost all sent him the same answer. Dot, dot, dot. Not only that, everyone returned the money to him. What did this mean? Simons was shocked. Could it be that Bessie was at a point where she was beyond help? The phone in the hall rang. Simons, it's Joshua's phone. The maid held out the phone and spoke respectfully to Simons. Simons answered the phone worriedly. Mr. Clark. He put the phone to his ear and spoke respectfully. People in their social circle in the capital knew a lot about Bessie's every movement, and Joshua had heard about her return. He had called Simons mainly to ask about this. Simons glanced upstairs, lowered his voice and said in a worried tone, Bessie is back to take her final exams, but all the teachers who tutored her returned the money. Did they think they couldn't save Bessie? In the capital, Joshua was sitting on the sofa. After talking to Simons, he was thoughtful. On the opposite sofa, Sherry sat cautiously. Grandpa Clark, was that Simons? In terms of seniority, Sherry was younger than Michael. It was him. Joshua smiled. He'd had Sherry come over today mainly to ask about 129. Sherry had become an ordinary member of 129 last year, which caused a lot of waves in their circle. I heard that Michael went to Austria to play. Is he finally back? Sherry pursed her lips and smiled, then glanced at Joshua. Are you worried about the girl next to him? Only then did Joshua raise his eyes and calmly said, She's going to take her final exams, and I especially sent Simons to handle this matter. Final exams? Sherry was taken aback. She pursed her lips and said in surprise, Last year Marvin said 
that Bessie doesn't need to take her finals, and that both the Clark and the Bright families have made arrangements? A middle-aged man outside the door came in and sneered when he heard Sherry's words. The Clark family made arrangements? Who arranged it for her? Let Michael face his big words for himself. The Clark family shouldn't have to lose face. Aaron! Joshua put down the teacup in his hand without a change in his expression and interrupted him directly with a sharp gaze. Taken aback, Sherry stood up cautiously. Grandpa Clark, I... No one had mentioned this matter to Joshua. His bleak eyes looked endless, but he smiled gently and waved his hands. It's okay. That kid always has her ideas. Listening to Joshua's words, Sherry's hands tightened slightly, but she just smiled. I will listen to what you said and won't bother you about it anymore. Joshua took her to the door himself. After Sherry left, Joshua walked back slowly. Dad... Aren't you too indulgent to Michael, arranging things for the woman he likes? If word gets out, what will the Clark family's reputation be? Aaron looked at Joshua, feeling it was unfair. You don't care? Enough. This is nothing. Joshua said lightly. He turned around and walked upstairs. Although his words were light, his brows were slightly twisted and knotted together. Outside the gate of Clark's house... The Flake family's car was waiting. Sherry stood by the car without getting in. Instead, she took out her cell phone and opened Twitter to check something. She had sent Marvin a message in the afternoon, but he had yet to respond. Was he busy? Sherry was a little irritable for no reason. Previously, when she messaged Marvin, he responded in seconds. Since he went to Austria, it seemed like everything had changed. What happened to them in Austria? The driver of the Flake family's car walked to the passenger seat and opened the door. After waiting for a long time and seeing that Sherry did not get in the car, he couldn't help but whisper, Miss? Sherry came back to her senses and pursed her lips, her expression barely changing. Let's go. She bent over and got into the car. On Monday, June 3rd, Brightbow High School was issuing admission passes for the final exams. Back at the Smith family's house, Anne had just arrived after her morning flight had landed. Aunt Ruth respectfully picked up the bag from her hand. Miss, you're back. Anne nodded slightly and smiled. She was now learning the violin from Mr. Anderson, and she had achieved success already. She was talented, but not too strong. But after returning from Austria, she worked harder than before to learn the violin. She had no time to rest almost every day. She was top-notch amongst the newcomers to the National Violin Association. Mr. Anderson also valued her very much and was waiting for her to compete for him at the National Violin Association's membership trial this year. Daryl knew that Anne was back today and he rushed over from the old house in the morning. Anne, are you going back to school in the morning to go through the procedures? Daryl's voice was gentle. Now that Bessie had no room to turn back... Daryl was running out of options, but Anne did not disappoint him. Yes, I'll go with Mom. Anne took the tea from Aunt Ruth, smiled slightly, and glanced at Grace. By the way, Mom, do you have any news from my sister? She should be back now that it's almost her finals, right? Grace shook her head and twisted her eyebrows slightly. Did that mean she was not back yet? Anne took a sip of tea and shook her head slightly, seeming to sigh. Is she going to stay for another year? It's a pity. I originally thought that we would get together in the capital. Let's stop talking about it. Grace raised her eyebrows and put down her teacup. Grace let Anne rest for a while, and in the afternoon, she went to the school to get the admission pass for the procedures. After finishing the procedures in the afternoon, I will take you to see your aunt. You haven't seen each other in a few months. After Grace had eaten, she sat on the sofa holding the mirror and touching up her lipstick. Anne nodded, not very interested. Okay. At the same time, in Brightbow High School's English class, it was the last day of classes. The next day marked the start of vacation for the freshman year of high school. Paul followed Kenneth, not very emotional. Weird. Why are there so many people in the corridor of our class? 
Paul looked up lazily and saw the silhouettes of people in the corridor of English class. Did they all come to find out your contact information, to fill in the student records? Paul glanced at Kenneth and raised his eyebrows. Since it was nearing graduation, a lot of people had come looking for Kenneth recently. Kenneth looked at the silhouettes, and a cold and cruel thought passed in his mind. After a pause, he lowered his eyebrows, hesitated, and said, It shouldn't be me they are looking for. Paul abruptly stopped and suddenly remembered another person. Episode 214 Bessie's Return Chaos in the High Schools His whole person was instantly radiant. He raised his head, pushed aside the group of people, and looked directly at the table near the window. Over the past six months, Mr. Scott had not changed seats because of the good learning atmosphere in the class and the rapid improvements in their grades. Moreover, students who changed positions may still need time to adapt. Mr. Scott listened to the suggestions of the students and did not change the seats again. The seat in the fourth row by the window was Bessie's seat. Finally, there was a figure in the previously empty seat. She was wearing a white t-shirt, her face was tilted slightly sideways, and she had a pen in her left hand. She was sending some messages to a few people, her eyebrows drooping in a familiar and cynical manner. Bessie, are you finally back? Paul found his voice after being stunned and walked over to her. Bessie's classmates at the table moved to give him space, as always. Yeah, Bessie said as she continued to write casually. She was no longer slow with her left hand. Almost everyone's eyes were on her. Kenneth also came in through the back door, sat on his chair, and habitually took out the physics book. While opening the book, he involuntarily glanced at Bessie. As the first period approached, Paul finally left Bessie, but his excitement had not subsided. He poked Kenneth's back with a pen. Kenny, what do you think of Bessie's physics? Seeing that the final exam is only a few days away, the teachers are still betting on it. Hearing Paul's voice, Kenneth's eyebrows trembled. I don't know. Just after finishing his sentence, his phone rang on the table beside him. Kenneth put down his pen and took a look at his phone. When Paul saw his reaction, he knew that this message was sent by Anne and couldn't help rolling his eyes. She also returned to Chicago? Yeah. Kenneth responded lightly, but he moved his hand quickly to reply to Anne. The last lesson in the afternoon was the class meeting. Mr. Scott explained a lot of life principles to the entire class and then issued admission passes. After writing the words, to be at the top, on the blackboard, the class was dismissed. This concluded the last class of high school freshman year. The whole class stood up and said in an unprecedentedly neat and loud voice, Goodbye, teacher. There was nothing on Bessie's desk, so she just put away her admission pass and waited for Mary. She received a message from Andrea, asking her to go out to dinner that night. Bessie responded with an, Okay. As usual, Paul stood at the back door, waiting for her with a basketball. Bessie wore a cap on her head. She sent a message to Michael that she would go to Andrea's that night, before meeting up with Paul. Kenneth fell one step behind the others and looked forward. They were all influential figures in the first year of their high school. Standing together, this group of people attracted the attention of most students. Bessie is back, a student said excitedly. Another person also lowered his voice. So, who do you think will score the highest on their finals? Bessie, Kenneth, or Scarlett? Or someone else in Brightbow High School? With Bessie's return to school, everyone was talking about her. Everyone seemed to have forgotten Chloe, who was also troubled by the problems faced by the Harper family. Her grades had dropped drastically. Chloe heard this and looked in the direction of Bessie and the others, her hands tightening on her backpack. With a black face, she looked gloomy and terrifying. At Andrea's house, she was making soup in a pot. After more than half a year, Andrea's legs had long since healed and there was no sense of difficulty in her actions. Pete sat on the chair outside, holding a book in his hand and looking in the direction of the door from time to time. 
There was a knock on the door outside, and Pete raised his hand to open the door without waiting for Andrea to move. Some relief could be seen on his always cold face. Outside the door stood Anne and Grace. Pete saw that it was these two people and, with a light tone, he stepped aside and said, Auntie. Then he shouted in the direction of the kitchen, Mom, Auntie is here. His voice was loud. Susan heard it from her room and immediately excitedly came out. Anne and Grace are here? She hurriedly poured water for the two of them, her expression revealing her excitement. Downstairs, Marvin stopped the car and Bessie opened the door. She said with a calm tone, You can go back now. Come pick me up later. Marvin nodded and asked Bessie to call him in advance. Bessie climbed to the sixth floor and knocked on the door. It was still Pete who opened the door. He lowered his eyebrows, his expression still cold, but his voice suddenly eased. Mom, Bessie is here. Bessie went in. In the narrow hall, Grace and the three others sitting at the table saw Bessie and looked as if they had seen a ghost. Bessie, when did you come back? Grace put down the cup with a thud and looked at Bessie in disbelief. Why did you suddenly drop out of school? Bessie had not expected to see them here either. She pulled the stool out and sat down, crossing her legs like she usually did. I just got back. Pete poured her a cup of tea. It was the same cup she always used before, with strawberries printed on it. When Anne saw her, her expression changed for a while before she came back to her senses. She looked at Bessie with a caring tone, as if all the previous barriers did not exist. Bessie, where have you been the past few months? I didn't go anywhere. Bessie took a sip of tea casually. Just walked around. Oh, Anne smiled, not caring much. Susan pressed her lips together. She didn't dare to look at Bessie now, so she only pressed her lips and looked at Anne with a smile. Anne, how many fans do you have on Twitter now? Anne glanced at the teacup, did not drink, and seemed indifferent. Nine million, maybe? Andrea brought out a bowl of food from the kitchen. What's nine million? Just Anne's Twitter, Mom. Don't you know that she was posted online last year at a performance at the Royal Performing Arts Hall in the Capitol? And she unexpectedly became popular. Susan said with envy, She's so popular online now. Anne played with the cup, looked up at Bessie, smiled, and pretended not to care about the number of fans on her Twitter. Pete helped Andrea arrange the dishes. At the dinner table, Andrea politely asked about Anne's current situation. Anne went to Austria with her teacher. When Grace mentioned this, her tone couldn't conceal her pride. She's now in the National Violin Association, ranking first among other students. Susan raised her head and said in surprise, Austria? Austria was a collective hub, home of the International Trade Center, where many big figures gathered. Susan had only been taken there by her teacher when she was taking a geography class, but it was not recommended for ordinary people to go. If they wanted to go, they needed to find tourist groups to bring them in. Anne smiled and acted nonchalantly. She picked up her fork and said, Well, I'm going to try for the National Violin Association of Austria. She did not say much more about it, as they probably wouldn't understand even if she did. Anne looked at Bessie. Bessie, you said last year that you wanted to be admitted to Northwestern University after you graduate. Do you remember? Anne looked at Bessie. Of course, Anne did not mean to mock Bessie. She had seen Austria and saw a bigger world. Now she did not even consider Bessie, who had been repeating the same grade for a year or two, as her opponent. Susan had told Anne about Mr. Grint after Bertha's funeral last year. Anne was extremely worried at that time because she knew that Bessie learned the violin when she was a child. She had some doubts at the time as to whether Mr. Grint would want to accept Bessie as a student. But until Anne went to the Capitol, she had never seen Bessie at the Association, nor had anyone mentioned Bessie. As for Mr. Grint, after Bertha's funeral, he had also returned to the National Violin Association and attended many large-scale events. Anne and many other students went to Mr. Grint's classes, 
She had paid careful attention and had never heard of Bessie being mentioned by anyone around Mr. Grint. Anne had even asked someone in the association to inquire about Bessie, but the answer she got was that they had never heard Bessie's name. Anne finally let her guard down then. It seemed that Mr. Grint was not trying to recruit Bessie as his student, but this was not surprising. Still, if Bessie had known Mr. Grint a long time ago, why did he never mention her? Thinking of this, Anne slowly took a bite of her vegetables and raised her eyebrows to look at Bessie. Her mood suddenly soured. She didn't know that Bessie had been in Austria for more than half a year, nor did she know what Bessie was doing. She had assumed that Bessie did not feel like studying, just like before, so she dropped out again. After all, Bessie had a habit of doing this. The relationship between Anne and Bessie had always been tense. She hated everything about Bessie. Bessie didn't even have to do anything, and people around her would involuntarily pay attention to her. But now, Anne felt that she had gotten away from being stuck in Chicago and had almost gotten rid of her own family, reaching a point that Bessie could never reach in this lifetime. She no longer cared about her past friction with Bessie. After hearing Anne's question about Northwestern University, Bessie was silent for a moment. Then she looked up at her. Andrea coughed. Bessie, have some soup. I spent all afternoon cooking it. She picked up the bowl beside Bessie and filled it with soup for her. Bessie took the soup that Andrea poured for her and picked up her spoon. She casually ate a spoonful of soup and replied to Anne in a casual tone. Yes, I plan to take the test. Phew. Anne made a condescending sound. Looking at Bessie, she couldn't help but laugh. Okay, Bessie, work hard and take the exam. I'll be waiting for you in the Capitol. Grace was sitting next to Anne. If it had been a year ago, she would have spoken to Bessie. But today, even though her brows were knitted, she did not speak. Pete lowered his head to eat, his expression as cold as ever. Susan, are you ready to take your final exams too? Anne did not feel any threat from Bessie. She ate two bites happily, then put down her fork and looked at Susan. Susan lowered her head in embarrassment and pursed her lips. Yes. Most schools in the capital required high scores. Episode 215 Anne's Indifference to Bessie Pete could pass the exam. Although Susan's previous results were not as good as Pete's, she was not bad. In the past, she was able to score in the top 10. But in the past six months or so, her grades had fallen more and more severely. Now she was only around 30th in rank, wandering between the middle and lower ranks. Anne nodded. Well, I have some notes at home, if you need them. Come back to the Smith family house with me to get them later. Hearing Anne's words, Susan raised her head and said in awe, Thank you, Anne. Bessie originally had something to say to Andrea, but Anne and Grace were here, so she wasn't in the mood and sent a message to Marvin for him to come over. Anne did not want to stay longer at Andrea's house either and left to return to the Smith family house after dinner. Seeing her leave, Susan immediately put down what she had in her hand. While following Anne, she shouted, Mom, I'm going to get the notes with Anne. Grace was one step behind the two and waited for Bessie. Bessie, why did you drop out of school again? Grace pursed her lips, not knowing what tone to use. Also, Anne said that Mr. Grint did not accept any students this year. Where have you been all these months? Bessie glanced at her phone. Marvin replied that Michael was coming to pick her up. She put her phone away and did not read the message again. She also did not reply to Grace's words. Her expression was completely indifferent. Grace knew that she was angry. She had wanted to ask Mayor Grant and Mr. Grant about Bessie, but seeing Bessie like this, she couldn't speak. Even when your sister learned the violin, she did not fall behind in her studies. She could still rely on her grades to get into Northwestern University. I know you have always hated me, but is this my only problem? If you were as obedient as your sister and had the same good grades, forget it. 
I'm leaving. After she finished speaking, she turned on her high heels to leave. Bessie was already a few steps behind Grace, and after that, she walked even slower. When she got down to the front steps, Grace had already gotten into the passenger seat and closed the door. The weather had not been so good recently. It started to drizzle as the night fell. Bessie was standing at the door. The Smith family's car did not leave immediately, and the rear window rolled down, revealing Anne's pretty, composed face. Bessie, where are you going? I can have the driver take you. It's raining and the road is not easy to walk. Bessie was playing with her mobile phone in her hand. Hearing Anne's words, she raised her eyes and responded with a cool tone. No need. Anne smiled and wanted to say that it was no trouble, but at this time, a black car slowly stopped by the roadside. A clean-cut, tall figure got out of the driver's seat. It was windy and rainy, but the figure was still calm. The dim streetlight reflected off of him as he walked slowly towards the door with a black silk umbrella, as if coming out of an ink painting. Michael stood at the bottom of the steps and waited for Bessie to come down, ignoring the looks from the car and lowering his voice. Should I go up and see your aunt? Bessie tucked the phone back into her pocket, shook her head and said in a low voice, No, she has to work overtime tonight. Michael still thought about it, but decided not to go up in the end. When he returned, he would ask Marvin to send a bunch of things to Andrea. The two walked towards the car together. Not far away, the Smith family's car had not driven away yet, and the group of people inside the car saw this scene unfold in front of their eyes. Anne had met Michael before, but then she had gone to the Capitol and she didn't know what had happened next. Studying under Mr. Anderson, Anne had also met many people, especially at the large dinners she attended in the Capitol and during her trip to Austria. But she had never seen anyone more striking than the person at Bessie's side. Mom, do you know him? Anne asked as she looked out of the car window. Grace shook her head, shrinking her neck involuntarily. He's a doctor with the last name Clark. I don't know anything else. Susan also looked out the window, a complicated look in her eyes. Seeing the two get into the car, she couldn't help but tilt her head and glance again. Susan had also met many children from rich families in the capital last year, but none of them had a temperament and appearance comparable to Michael. Seeing the black car drive away, Susan pulled her eyes away. Anne nodded, and she noticed that the car Michael got into was a black Volkswagen with a license plate from the Capitol. She couldn't help squinting her eyes slightly. Clark? She had stayed in the Capitol for more than half a year, and yet she had never heard of the last name, Clark. Moreover, he drove a Volkswagen. Anne couldn't help but withdraw her gaze. Their car would be reaching the Smith family's house soon. Susan had been to the Perez family's house in the capital before. There was still a slight gap between the Smith family and the Perez family. Therefore, even when she came to the Smith family for the first time, Susan did not get surprised, but followed Anne silently. Back so early? David and Daryl were sitting on the sofa and discussing matters. Now the Smith family no longer saw Anne as invisible, especially Daryl. Anne changed into a pair of slippers. We came back after eating at Aunt Andrea's house. She said again after a pause, Dad, Grandpa, do you know who I saw at Aunt Andrea's house? Who? Daryl laughed. My sister, she's back for the final exams. Anne's voice was very excited. Daryl was taken aback for a moment, but did not ask much. She's back? She had not attended school for more than seven months and her grades were not good. He was not interested in whether or not Bessie could take her finals. Seeing the expressions of Daryl and David, Anne pursed her lips and smiled without saying much. She turned sideways and spoke warmly to Susan. Let's go to my study to get you the notes. Anne took Susan to her study upstairs, took down a bunch of notebooks, and handed them to Susan. Susan took them immediately and said excitedly, Thank you, Anne. No problem, Anne said lightly, 
Upstairs, Chloe was on the phone with her family, talking about the college entrance examination. As she was still on the phone, she started to walk downstairs. When she went downstairs, she happened to see Susan. Chloe had never met Grace's relatives and naturally did not know Susan. Susan was in a different class and she had no reputation at school. But Chloe herself was well known in school, especially as a student who had transferred from the capital at the beginning of the year. Plus, she was also a substitute for Team OST. Her reputation in the school was akin to that of Thunder. However, her popularity in the school declined due to her trouble with the English class. But Susan still recognized Chloe. She held the pile of materials from Anne and spoke respectfully to Chloe. Chloe. Chloe still had her mobile phone in her hand. Hearing Susan's voice, she only replied with a faint, Um, as arrogant as ever, without speaking. Susan knew that she was from the capital, so not daring to say anything, she turned around and left. Because of her quick turn, an old photo fell out of her pile of review materials. Susan had already gone downstairs. Chloe saw the photo fall, but couldn't be bothered to tell Susan. She ignored the old photo at first. Then, from the corner of her eye, Chloe paused when she saw the figure in the old photo. Mom, I'll hang up first. She said to the person on the other end of the phone, then cut off the call. She squatted down, leaned over, and picked up the photo at her feet. There were four people in the photo. She recognized the second person on the left as Bessie, and there was an old woman in the middle. The first person on the left was a girl who she had just met, and the first person on the right was a cold-looking boy. Chloe brought the photo closer and couldn't help squinting. After being in school for so long, she naturally heard some things about Bessie's sudden suspension from school. And many of the rumors said that Bessie's grandmother had passed away and she couldn't bear the shock. The news was not particularly credible, but Chloe knew that Bessie was indeed brought up by her grandmother. And Bessie... It was true that she had dropped out of school after her grandmother had passed away. No matter what, Bessie cared about her grandmother. Chloe looked at this photo thoughtfully. Aunt Ruth came up with a glass of water and looked at Chloe suspiciously. Miss Harper, aren't you going to rest? Chloe immediately tucked the photo back into her pocket. She pondered for a moment, then nodded and said calmly, Yes, I'm going to rest now. At the same time in Anne's room, she was calling Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson's voice was slightly low. The assessment by the association will be in two months. It will be no problem for you to get first place among those students. Then I will ask Mr. Grint to recommend you to the Austria National Violin Association. Mr. Anderson himself definitely did not have the qualifications to recommend candidates to the Austria Association. Only Mr. Grint could contact people in Austria after searching several times through the entire Violin Association. There were many new members of the Violin Association this year, and Anne may not have been the most talented. But she was the most hardworking and the most famous. Her fans on Twitter were also approaching 10 million. Hearing Mr. Anderson speak of the Austria Association, a trace of arrogance appeared in Anne's eyes. Austria and the capital were the ultimate goals of her struggle. She had just showered, and she was wearing a bathrobe, standing by the French window. She opened the window and her eyes filled with confidence. Thank you, teacher. She told Mr. Anderson a few things about the National Violin Association and Austria, and suddenly remembered running into Michael at Andrea's that night. Teacher, I have one more question I want to ask you. She squinted slightly. Mr. Anderson did not hang up the phone. He had always been patient with Anne. Ask away. Is there a family with the last name Clark in the capital? Anne pursed her lips. Clark? Mr. Anderson's voice tightened when Anne mentioned this. When she said Clark, he could only think of the courtyard in that alley. Episode 216 Family Dinner at Andrea's House Anne looked at the tree outside the window. Her voice was somewhat indifferent and very weak. 
It's okay, I was just asking. My sister seems to be very close to a man from the capital, with the last name Clark. Well, at first, Mr. Anderson thought that Anne had provoked the Clark family. Hearing this sentence, his heart loosened. He had heard of Anne's sister, but he couldn't get in touch with the Clark family at all. He calmed down. The Clark family is an influential family, but I haven't seen their power. It should have nothing to do with your sister. Hearing Mr. Anderson's words, Anne smiled. I see. Rest early, teacher. Mr. Anderson had never seen it, and it should have nothing to do with the man next to Bessie. After all, that man was a doctor. Anne put down her phone and went to the bathroom to get a hairdryer to dry her hair. After drying her hair, her phone rang a few times. It was Kenneth. Now that she was back in Chicago, Anne had not been as clingy towards Kenneth as before. She glanced at the message Kenneth had sent. Then she asked which school Kenneth was going to for the exam, and Kenneth replied to her, Gwen Park High School. Gwen Park High School? Anne was in Charles Wheeler High School. She did not say anything else. At the downtown villa, Simons was wearing his glasses to look at Bessie's admission pass and a stack of materials. Simons flipped through the notebook in his hand and said solemnly, Bessie is taking an exam at Brightbow High School. The day after tomorrow, we will take Bessie to see the examination room and get familiar with it. Michael glanced at Bessie. She was sitting on the opposite side of the room, playing with her mobile phone. Hearing this, she raised her eyes. No. I made an appointment with my classmates to see the examination room. She, Paul, and Mary were all in the same school, Brightbow High School, Charles Wheeler High School's century-old rival. Simons put away the notebook and nodded. Then let Marvin take you to Brightbow High School tomorrow. He thought for a while and called the chef out again, asking him to prepare food fit for students taking final exams in the next few days. The chef nodded and then took careful notes. Hearing such meticulous instructions from Simons, he couldn't help but glance at Bessie. He wondered in regard to Bessie's grades. Could it be possible to pass the exam with such a meticulous preparation of food? He did not dare to talk more about the host's affairs, and only secretly complained in his heart. Bessie's mobile phone rang at this time. It was Samuel asking her to play games. After thinking about it, she mentioned it to Michael and went upstairs to play the game. Why is Samuel asking Bessie to play games at this time? Isn't this hurting Bessie? Simons looked at Marvin with a serious expression and a worried tone. Marvin looked at Simons very inscrutably and then turned to go to the flower room. Captain Baldwin. Simons held a small notebook. What happened to Marvin recently? Captain Baldwin stood up immediately and shook his head in a very respectful voice. Mr. Marvin is always very mysterious. Simons did not know what to say. June 5th was the day Bessie had made an appointment with Paul and Mary to see the examination room. Brightbow High School was almost the same size as Charles Wheeler High School. There were three teaching buildings. Mary and Bessie were in the same building, and Paul was in the last building. The three went to see the examination rooms together. All high schools and universities in Chicago had been on vacation since yesterday. The examination rooms were open today. Students could visit the examination rooms on the 5th and 6th, so as not to delay the exam time on the day if the candidates were not familiar with the route. It was noon now, and there was not too many people coming to see the examination rooms. Chicago was a big city, and groups of students walking together could be seen nearby. Paul looked at the strong sunlight above his head and suggested, Bessie, shall we go to eat burgers? Bessie put her cap on her head and pressed it down. She then said in a casual tone, Up to you. Not far away, a truck sped up. Bessie did not pay attention at first. She did not slow down until the truck turned the corner and came towards the crowd. Her expression changed. Something was wrong. She reached out and pushed Paul and Mary away. Ah! A group of students screamed behind them, and the scene suddenly became chaotic. 
Bessie did not move. She reached out her hand and pushed away Mary and Paul, but she did not leave immediately. Not knowing whether the car was acting this way on purpose or out of control, Bessie pressed her lips together and tried to find a way to control it. However, when her gaze fell on a photo in the path of the car's wheels, her eyes suddenly became blood red. It happened very quickly. This uncontrolled truck would have knocked into the group of students, causing most of them to suffer injuries. But everyone suddenly realized the car had stopped. No one knew Bessie was under the truck until she crawled out from under the tires. In the chaos, no one had seen her movements. They only saw her afterward, holding a photo, with blood on her left hand and the left side of her body. After Mary was pushed away by Bessie, she was stunned for several seconds before realizing what she was seeing. Bessie! She rushed to Bessie to see Bessie's injuries. Bessie had a lot of blood on her body, especially on her left hand. Trembling all over, Mary was afraid to touch her. Bessie, where are you hurt? You... Paul also ran over with a pale face, and while talking on his cell phone to make a call, he pulled Mary away. Bessie is hurt. Don't touch her. At this time, the other students also reacted. Someone called the police and someone went to see the truck driver. Mary only really reacted now. She was so shocked that she had only stared at Bessie's left hand and forgotten to cry. Paul. Mary's words were already unclear. Look at Bessie's left hand. What do we do if something happens to her left hand? Bessie was a dark horse in Brightbow High School, and all the teachers and students were very optimistic about her test scores. Many people even guessed that she would be the number one scorer this time. If her left hand was injured because of this, Mary couldn't even bear to think about what to do next. In these two days, due to the final exams that were scheduled, most schools had added security guards to ensure the safety of the candidates during the examination period. When the out-of-control truck incident occurred at Brightbow High School, the security team heard the screams from the students and parents and hurriedly headed in that direction. Some family members of the students at the scene called the police and some looked for an ambulance. Everyone realized that Bessie had rescued them and a group of people rushed over to her. Paul was usually not a serious person, but in this situation, he calmed down before Mary. While he took out his mobile phone to call someone, he stood in front of Bessie to block the crowd, and his voice was very heavy. Don't squeeze. Leave some space. This brought a little order into the chaotic scene. Other crowds from not far away also came to watch. A middle-aged man with a flat head got up from the ground and pulled up his daughter next to him. His tone anxious. Are you okay? He asked his daughter. I'm okay, Dad. Let's go and see Bessie. This girl was also a freshman from Brightbow High School. Thus, she knew the popular kids, Paul and Bessie. The middle-aged man was a doctor. Hearing what his daughter said, he nodded and turned to Bessie. Everyone, I'm a doctor. Let me see this student's injury. Bessie's body was still bloody. Hearing that there was a doctor at the scene, the crowd woed and let the middle-aged man pass through. Mary and Paul also turned to give him a path, both looking at him. Bessie was not wearing a white t-shirt today. She was wearing a red and black plaid shirt. The bloodstains on her clothes were not particularly obvious, but he could see something strange on her left arm along the sleeve. The middle-aged man was an orthopedic surgeon, and he could tell at a glance that her condition was not good. Ah! Bessie came back to her senses. The middle-aged man breathed a sigh of relief. What do you feel in your right hand? He asked. She lowered her head and looked at her right hand. She had an old photo in her right hand, which was a bit gray and bloody. She lifted her chin and said calmly, It's okay. That's good. The middle-aged man nodded, slightly relieved. He then looked at Paul and Mary. Don't touch the patient's left hand. There could also be other bruises on her body. Neither Paul nor Mary answered as the voice of the middle-aged man echoed in their ears like thunder on a sunny day. The school security team also quickly took control of the truck driver and managed the scene. Let's go. 
she said. The voices of the people around were too loud. Bessie frowned and tucked the photo back into her pocket, her voice calm. She acted as if she was not injured at all. After they left, the middle-aged man's daughter dared to come over. Dad, is Bessie all right? Fortunately, only her left hand was injured. The middle-aged man had also heard his daughter mention Bessie's name at home before. Those mentions had been more frequent recently. She had said that she was an extremely abnormal student. Almost no one was able to come in first for all the subjects. The middle-aged man breathed a sigh of relief when he said this. Fortunately, she did not hurt her right hand. Otherwise, it would be a pity. Left hand? His daughter was stunned. The middle-aged man hesitated for a while, then lowered his head and asked his daughter, What's the matter? His daughter looked in the direction of Bessie and the others leaving, her eyes in a daze, and murmured, She's left-handed. Episode 217 Bessie's Left Hand Bessie was five or six minutes away from the gate. Marvin was sitting in the driver's seat waiting for Bessie, Paul, and Mary. The commotion on the campus spread to the outside and many people were talking about an out-of-control truck. Many people also went into the school to see the commotion. There was the sound of an ambulance not far away and it seemed to be getting closer. Marvin felt a little uneasy, so he couldn't help pulling out the car key and getting out of the car onto the main road to find Bessie, Paul, and Mary. Just after turning a corner, he saw the group not far away. Seeing Paul standing out among the crowd, Marvin's heart sank. Before Bessie reached him, he could already smell blood. His expression changed. Bessie? There was no change on Bessie's face as she shook her head. Her voice was as calm as ever. Let's go to the hospital first. When Paul saw Marvin, he was a little relieved. Take her to the hospital. Leave things here to me. He had called earlier and arranged for people from the Adams family to come. There was something strange about the truck driver. The sound of the ambulance was getting closer and closer, but Marvin did not let Bessie wait for it. He took out the car keys while calling Michael. When he received the call, Michael was in a room with Rick sitting beside him. Sitting on both sides of them were several of Chicago's big figures. While the group was still chatting, Michael's phone rang. It was Marvin. Marvin only followed Bessie now and had stopped working on other things. If Marvin was calling, it was most likely regarding Bessie. Michael sat upright, reached out and picked up his phone before going outside and answering the call. After exchanging a few words, his originally calm face instantly sank. The lighting in the room was not bright and the air conditioner was turned on, but his face was covered in frost as if the temperature had dropped a few degrees. Rick was talking to the people around him in a low voice when he felt something wrong with the atmosphere. He was taken aback for a moment and raised his head to look at Michael. Sorry, something came up. Michael looked at Rick directly as he hung up his cell phone with dark eyes and a frosty face. Then he nodded politely. Before Rick and the others could reply, he went out with his cell phone. His tone and actions were all a rare display of panic. What's the matter? In the room, Rick and the others glanced at each other. Michael, this is... Someone looked at Rick. Rick looked at his cold back as it disappeared. He squinted his eyes and shook his head. Although they were in the same generation, he did not know Michael very well because of his age. So he often heard people mention him as the prince of the Clark family. Michael was well known in the capital, and everyone in that circle respectfully called him Mr. Clark. Not many people could meet with him. The circle mostly evaluated him as lazy. Most people in the capital spread rumors that he was not doing real things but only a few people knew that Michael hid his true feelings so well and deeply that he could always remain calm in the face of those old guys. Rick picked up his teacup and looked down, slightly puzzled. He had rarely seen such a big change in Michael's expression, but it was not like it never happened. Rick tapped his finger on the edge of the cup and suddenly a figure flashed across his mind. 
Marvin drove the car directly to Chicago Northwestern Memorial Hospital. On the way, Michael called the hospital. When Marvin brought Bessie in, the surgeon was already waiting. The 28th floor was a hospital assembly line reinstalled by Michael with his money, so there were various medical types of equipment here. At this moment, the director did not take Bessie to queue with the other patients. He went directly to the 28th floor and said as he walked, First, go for a full body checkup. Mr. Clark will be here soon. Knowing the importance of this patient, a layer of cold sweat formed on his forehead and back. Several nurses went in following the director. Marvin and Mary waited outside. There was a row of blue chairs outside, but neither of them sat down. Mary leaned against the wall. There was air conditioning the entire way here, but her forehead was covered in sweat, and her hair was scattered around her forehead, sticking to her face. Is Bessie's left hand okay? She was still at a loss since the truck accident. Marvin shook his head, expressing that he was unsure. Five minutes later, one side of the door to the inspection room opened, and the director came out. This time, he was calmer. The bone in her left hand is cracked. There is a scratch, and her calf also has a scratch. The patient has no life-threatening injuries. When speaking, the doctor also sighed in relief. Marvin's heart plummeted because of the doctor's words. Cracked bone? It would take at least four weeks to heal properly. But the day after tomorrow was final exams. Michael was still on his way here. Marvin was still holding his cell phone, and Michael was waiting for his call. But at this time, he did not know what to say. Just then, the elevator stopped on the 28th floor. The door opened and a long and cold figure stepped out. Michael had undertaken many operations in this hospital. As there were images of him performing surgery posted around the hospital, several surgeons knew him, and so did the director who examined Bessie. Michael had always done things calmly. Even if the operation encountered an emergency, he would never rush and would never be phased. This was the first time the director had seen him with this expression. Michael's delicate eyebrows were bent, perverse, and cruel. Michael, Bessie is still being checked inside. The doctor said that she has a fractured bone. Marvin said. Michael looked at the half-opened door. He did not immediately go in, but stretched out his hand to unbutton a button on his collar. The phone rang. It was Officer Gomez. The corner of Michael's mouth twitched, and a bloodthirsty smile formed on his face. His voice was soft as he asked, Where is the one who did this? You didn't bring him here? The Adams family came to Brightbow High School soon after Bessie and the others had left. Bring this driver to the hospital. Paul glanced at the driver who had been dragged out from his car, his expression cold. The Adams family made a fortune in real estate and was reputable in Chicago, so nobody dared to say anything about his order. When Officer Gomez arrived, Paul had already ordered his men to take the driver to the hospital. The scene was sealed off and a cordon was set up around the street. Some people were looking for surveillance cameras while another group of people was investigating the cause of the accident and collecting suspicious points. Officer Gomez, that kid took the suspect away. The person in charge came forward after seeing Officer Gomez and reported immediately. Officer Gomez had met Paul several times because of Bessie, so they naturally knew each other. Hearing this, he simply nodded without saying anything. He walked over to Paul and asked him what happened. Bessie's left hand is injured. Paul glanced at his phone, his pursed lips cold. Mary had just sent him the results from the hospital. Left hand? Officer Gomez frowned. I see. Since Officer Gomez could be trusted, Paul handed the scene to him and rushed to the hospital to see Bessie. The Adams family's driver waited for Paul to get into the car before driving straight to the hospital. As the car turned a corner, Paul felt like something was wrong. He looked out of the window. Officer Gomez and Mayor Grant were very concerned about Bessie, so it was reasonable to say that Officer Gomez would be extremely angry and distressed after learning that she had injured her left hand two days before her final exams. Officer Gomez had indeed been furious just now, but as for any signs of distress, Paul frowned. <laughs>
he hadn't seemed distressed. The whole high school was on break, so Samuel didn't need to go to the school doctor's office these days. He went to the downtown villa early in the morning to find Bessie and Michael. Unexpectedly, they were not at the villa. Sitting on the sofa, he reached out to touch his ear studs and looked at Captain Baldwin, who was sitting not too far away. He supported his chin with one hand and asked indifferently, Captain Baldwin, you're Michael's subordinate, but you're following Bessie now? Why haven't I seen you before? When Captain Baldwin returned to America, Christopher had explained to him carefully what could and could not be said. At this time, he only replied respectfully, Samuel, I'm following Mr. Clark. Oh, Samuel nodded in understanding. Out of all the Clark brothers, it was rumored that only Marvin had been placed in an important position, while the others had been exiled. It was extremely impressive for them to be able to come back after being exiled. It's not easy to come back. Samuel glanced appreciatively at Captain Baldwin. It was indeed not easy to follow Bessie. There weren't many people who could call Bessie's name so naturally, so Captain Baldwin also looked at Samuel in awe. Samuel had already sent a message to Bessie asking when she would be back, but she had yet to respond. He laid down on the sofa and told Simons what he wanted to eat for lunch. Simons noted the dishes down one by one to report to the kitchen. He turned around and was about to go to the kitchen when the phone on the coffee table in the hall rang. Samuel was sitting on the side of the coffee table, his legs resting lazily on it. He was closest to the phone, so he picked it up directly and even turned to say to Simons, It must be Bessie. But before he finished his sentence, he paused. Almost instantly, his expression turned extremely gloomy. He hung up the phone by slamming it down then put down his legs, stood up, and walked outside with his car keys. As the youngest son of the Bright family, Samuel was always indifferent. In that way, he was somewhat similar to Bessie. Hence, Simons was surprised at his sudden, swift movement. Samuel, what happened? Samuel had already reached the gate when he heard Simons. Pausing, he turned around, a cigarette in his mouth, and chuckled coldly. Someone wants to die. Episode 218 Why Can't I Take My Final Exams? By the time Samuel arrived at the hospital, Marvin and Michael were in the corridor. A fat man was slumped on the floor. It was the truck driver. Mary was with Bessie in the ward. Samuel got down from the elevator, threw the cigarette into the trash can, and walked over. Michael, is this him? He raised his foot and kicked the person behind him, chuckling coldly. The Adams family's bodyguard said immediately, This man is very tight-lipped. He refuses to give us an explanation. Michael had just come out after helping Bessie deal with her injuries. Hearing this, he remained silent and only squatted down slowly. He grabbed the man's collar and forced him to look up at him. With dark eyes like the unchanging night sky, Michael asked, did you hit her? The chauffeur admitted it, very simply. Yes. Did someone instruct you to do it? The driver thought of what the man had said to him and refused to sell him out. He even put on a mocking smile and said carelessly, No, it's completely due to my brake failure. I will carry any consequence by myself. The man had told him that since it was an incident of brake failure and he hadn't fled the scene nor killed anyone intentionally, he wouldn't be severely sentenced. And as a result of this incident, he would give him $500,000. It was worth it. Okay. Michael let go of him and nodded slightly. He stood up and Marvin handed him a document that had just been printed not long ago. The driver laid on the ground, his forehead bruised. He was slightly frightened by Michael's light actions. When he looked up, he saw the information in Michael's hands. There were several pictures printed on the back of the paper. It was a woman and a child. Their outlines were blurred, but anyone familiar with them would be able to recognize them. The driver's expression changed drastically. Wait, I said... Michael put away the document and wiped his hands with a piece of paper towel calmly. 
Marvin directly covered the chauffeur's mouth and pressed down. His tough face was expressionless, and he only sneered. Michael already gave you a chance, but you still refused to speak the truth. Since you're unwilling, you can't keep quiet about it forever. In terms of truth, there had yet to be a case where Michael hadn't uncovered the truth. Most of the people in Evanston knew how ruthless he was. The driver struggled harder when he heard this, but Marvin was not the same person anymore. Even if he had the strength of 10 more people, he had no chance of escaping from Marvin. Michael lowered his head and ignored the driver. After wiping his hands clean, he leaned on the wall instead of going in. He took out a cigarette, his expression light. But anyone familiar with him knew that his mood was now on the verge of extreme danger. Samuel glanced at him and didn't dare to disturb him. Without asking further about who had the nerve to instigate this incident, he went into the ward to see Bessie, signaling for the others to leave as well. Michael stood by the trash can, his cigarette lit. He didn't smoke it and just watched as it slowly burned to the end. His phone rang in his pocket and he picked it up directly. It was Joshua. I've heard from Simons. Joshua's voice was calm and his face was speckled with deep gorges. It doesn't matter whether she can participate in her final exams. I'll arrange the rest of the matter. Under the cloud of smoke, Michael's eyebrows gave off an evil aura. His voice was very soft, and he sounded almost amused. No need, Dad. He hung up the phone and walked into the ward. Bessie didn't know that her injury this time had not only shocked the people in Chicago, but also several other influential people in Evanston. In the ward, Mary, Samuel, and Paul were all there. Simons had hurried over quickly after Samuel and had brought bags with boxes filled with soups and other dishes. He placed them on the table and took out the dishes one by one. Noticing Bessie's arm in a cast out of the corner of his eye, his heart simply sank. Bessie, drink the soup first. The temperature of the soup was just right, so Simons handed it to her. Mary sat beside Bessie's bed, telling her all the gossip about the driver excitedly. Everyone had been extremely careful inside, including Samuel. Nobody dared mention Bessie's left hand. They didn't want to rub salt into her wound. Bessie reached for the soup without any pain from her arm. There was no hint of sadness on her face, and she just drank the soup slowly. Sitting beside her, Mary couldn't go on about gossip anymore and burst out. Bessie, just cry if you want to. Don't suppress it. Cry? Bessie raised her head in surprise. Why would I cry? It's okay if you can't take your final exams this year. Mary squeezed her hand. I've thought about it. My grades might not be good enough to get accepted into Northwestern University after I graduate, so I'll repeat the year with you. Paul scratched his head. He didn't dare to say that he would also repeat the year with Bessie. His dad had always said that he was dissolute, so he might break his legs if he said he wanted to repeat a year. Simons took another stack of ribs out and comforted her in a low voice. Miss Miller, it's okay if you can't take the exam. I have already informed the elder, Mr. Clark. Everyone was speaking in comforting tones, without any hint of great pity. They didn't want to affect Bessie's mentality. Wait. Bessie finally found an opportunity to speak. She glanced at them with a puzzled expression. Why can't I take my final exams? Paul heard this and scratched his head. He just glanced silently at Bessie's left hand. The fact that Bessie was left-handed was known by the whole school, but now her left hand was in a cast. The director of the orthopedics department had said just now that even with the experimental drugs in the laboratory, Bessie wouldn't be able to use her left hand for a while. But her finals were the day after tomorrow. Unless they could turn back time... How else was she going to take the exam? After hearing her words, everyone in the ward felt like she couldn't accept the fact that she couldn't take her final exams. They were genuinely afraid of upsetting her, so they followed along and Mary immediately changed her tune. You can take the exams, of course you can. You're so impressive. Simons also tried his best. Bessie, you can take the exams anytime you want. Bessie was speechless. She didn't know how to reply to those people. 
carrying a bag of medicine, Michael came in while answering a call from Rick. The news of the car accident in Brightbow High School had been repressed. However, Michael had left his meeting in the middle of the conversation with such a bad expression, so a few people in Chicago had already found out what happened by asking around. The news of Bessie's accident had therefore leaked. It wasn't an accident. Rick knew about Bessie's relationship with Officer Gomez and Mayor Grant. He inquired about the situation while on the phone with Michael, afraid that someone would seek revenge for her. Michael lowered his eyes. There were many people in the ward, so he just responded calmly. No. Do you need manpower? Rick narrowed his eyes. Putting down the bag of medicine, Michael took out two bottles of medicine from inside and unscrewed the caps with one hand. I won't need your men. After he hung up, Rick raised an eyebrow. It looks like someone provoked him. Who was so brave? No one in Evanston dared to provoke him, but this person wasn't afraid of death. He thought for a moment and still took his coat and got up. His secretary asked him what he was doing, so he replied while taking out his phone to call Robert. I'm going over to check it out. Evanston wasn't as lively as Chicago these days. After he hung up the phone, Michael poured four pills on the lid and handed them to Bessie. Simons frowned at Bessie's plastered arm both worried and distressed. He immediately went to pour water for her. Before his hand even touched the glass bottle beside him, Michael had already poured a glass of water and handed it to Bessie. He watched as Bessie finished her meal and ate the medicine. Then, he stood up and motioned with his eyes for Samuel to come with him. As they came out of the room, Marvin arrived. What the fuck? Samuel had endured his anger in front of Bessie, but once the door was closed, he crushed the cigarette in his hand angrily. Who would do this? He shut his eyes. Before this, he had boasted about Bessie in front of many people. He had watched as Bessie blocked off everyone else in the school, surpassing them all by scoring first place in five subjects across the city. After taking a break from school for half a year and returning, the school forum was full of posts about her and some people were even speculating about this year's dark horses. Bessie was impressively on the list. Samuel had even prepared a big banner and had bought the largest advertising screen in the center of Chicago, ready to celebrate the whole city after receiving Bessie's final exam results. But who knew that something like this would happen at this time? Marvin fully empathized with Samuel's feelings and also chuckled coldly. Chloe, a member of the Harper family in Evanston. There's a Harper family in Evanston? Michael narrowed his eyes at Marvin. An outcast family. Samuel remembered this person. Chloe used to be Team OST's substitute player and had conflicts with Bessie before. Because of that, he had even ordered people to make moves on the Harper family. But who knew that they would be so brave and fearless? The nerve of them. Samuel threw the extinguished cigarette in his hand into the trash bin, then walked towards the stairs. Have you found out where she's at? Marvin followed him. She's in the Smith family's house. Previously, Samuel had managed to turn the Harper family into pandemonium with just one word, and they had almost been squeezed out of Evanston. But now that they had provoked Bessie, even if the Harper family was a cat with nine lives, it still wouldn't be enough for Chloe to live free and easy. It was lunchtime at the Smith family's house. Thomas had stayed at home today, busying himself in the study upstairs. The official news of the World Poker Tour won't be out until the end of the month. He sat in front of the computer with his headphones, talking to Jacob. On his computer was a three-dimensional map. Jacob responded, Do you know about Bessie's injury? Thomas was pressing the keyboard with one hand and holding the mouse in the other. When he heard this, his heart trembled and he pressed the wrong key before deleting it. Injury? He stood up immediately. His voice was tight. Her final exams were in two days. Recently, the Smith family had been tense because there were two candidates in the house. But Bessie was injured at this time? My dad just went to the hospital. I heard the bones in her left hand are fractured and she can't move it for a month. 
Wasn't she left-handed? Jacob shook his head. It's too strange. How could it have happened just two days before the examination? Thomas reached out and turned off the computer. His originally indifferent face was now laced with worry. Which hospital is she in? While talking, he walked downstairs. Downstairs, Chloe was deep in thought. She pushed the door open after seeing that there was no news on her phone. She didn't hear David calling her. Anne, David, and the others were all waiting at the dinner table. Chloe had just sat down when Thomas rushed down from upstairs. Thomas. Anne smiled at him. Where are you going? Episode 219. Chloe is detained. Thomas walked towards the door and paused before turning to look at Grace. Bessie was in a car accident and probably won't be able to take her exams. Grace, do you know about this? Hearing this, Chloe, who had just sat down, clenched her hands into fists aggressively, but no one noticed her expression. Grace shook her head and looked up at Thomas in shock. Is she okay? Her left hand suffered a bone fracture, but it's not life-threatening. Thomas frowned lightly. Grace's attitude made him feel very annoyed. He said nothing more and immediately left. After his departure, the people at the table exchanged glances. David put down his fork and frowned, slightly worried. How could she have encountered such a thing right before final exams? She's even left-handed. Then she won't be taking her final exams this year? Anne stared at Thomas's back and pursed her lips. After a while, she laughed. Hearing that Bessie wasn't in a life-threatening situation, she heaved a sigh of relief, but still had very complicated feelings. It's okay as long as she's fine. What difference does it make if she can't take the exam? After thinking about it, Grace turned to look at Anne. Anne, don't go outside during this time. Your hands are more valuable than others, so you must protect them. Got it, Mom. Anne looked away from Thomas. Previously, when Bessie had injured her right hand, Bertha told her that she wasn't left-handed. But Grace felt like it didn't matter. After all, Bessie had taken a leave of absence for more than a year despite her results. To her, it didn't make a difference whether or not she took the exam. It would be less embarrassing if other people thought that she had to repeat a year because she had injured herself in a car accident. Chloe, sitting on the side, seemed to relax after hearing that Bessie couldn't take her finals. Picking up her fork, she lowered her eyes and took a bite of rice, her drooping eyes full of mockery. Previously, because of Bessie, she had suffered countless setbacks in the Smith family and school. Ultimately, she had been kicked out of Team OST and her status had plummeted. Bessie had finally dropped out of school for half a year, but the moment she came back, the school forum had been filled with discussions about her. Chloe originally thought that Bessie's grades were so bad that the teachers didn't even bother, but who knew that her first midterm exam would be so surprising? Chloe took pride in her gaming and her studies, and in both, she had been crushed by Bessie. A seed of jealousy had germinated and grown into a towering tree. She noticed that Bessie never visited the Smith family after her return. After meticulous observation, it was obvious that Bessie wasn't in a good relationship with Anne. Without the protection of the Smith family and Anne, Chloe didn't feel a need to fear Bessie. Even though the Harper family was in a worse position than before, they were still untouchable to Bessie. Looking down at her phone, Chloe saw that there was no news on Twitter or the internet. She heaved a sigh of relief. If nobody paid any attention, Bessie wouldn't be able to cause big waves either. She picked up a piece of vegetable and was about to eat it. But a bodyguard rushed in from outside. Mr. Smith, bad news. Someone has broken in. Chloe turned to look out the door, completely unaware that this group of people had come for her. Unbeknownst to her, she had provoked some influential people. Broken in? David was very surprised at the guard's choice of words. Who would break in in this era? How did they break in? Who was it? For some reason, David felt slightly uneasy. 
He put down his fork and stood up, about to go outside to see what was going on. But then, the hall door was kicked open with a bang. A group of fierce-looking people barged in. Almost all of them looked vicious, and some even had weapons on their belts. The line of servants near the door couldn't help but stagger back a few steps, panicking. They stared in fear at the strangers who had just barged in. These people were divided into two rows and were all standing straight. From the door to the hall, and then from the gate, a few figures slowly walked over. The group of people was led by Samuel and Officer Gomez. Marvin and Captain Baldwin followed behind them. Further back, Rick, who had come to watch the show, also followed behind. The scene was a little familiar. David stared at Samuel and suddenly remembered seeing this exact scene when Bertha was critically ill last year. He particularly remembered Samuel's face. Putting down his fork, he took two steps forward and asked, a gentle smile still on his face, "'Sir, may I ask what's the matter?' He was even more shocked to see Rick standing at the back. "'Rick!' he gasped. He didn't dare to neglect these people and greeted Rick the moment he saw him. But before he could finish his greeting, Rick interrupted him directly. "'Ignore me. I just came over to watch the show.' He waved his hand and then raised an eyebrow at Samuel. Samuel's expression was cold, and his usual indifferent aura had completely disappeared. He swept his eyes across the entire dining table and fixed his eyes on Chloe. "'Take her away!' He didn't bother beating around the bush and directly nodded his head towards Chloe. A group of bodyguards stepped forward and took hold of Chloe, who was still in a daze. At the dining table, David, Anne, Grace, and the others were shocked. They stood up immediately. David's expression changed drastically in this scene. What crime has Chloe committed? What you're doing is illegal. The Harper family had entrusted Chloe to him, so how could he just let her be taken away like this? Samuel ignored David. He wasn't bothered with people of his level. The group of people took the dazed Chloe away. Larry Marshall. David saw the man at the end and recognized him out of all the other people. Expressionless, Larry paused a little before glancing at David. He lowered his voice and said indifferently, Mr. Smith, it's completely legal for us to take Miss Harper. As for why, unless you want your family's affluence to be gone, then it's best not to ask too much nor care too much. David chased after them, only to see the back of Samuel's car. He pressed his head, seeing stars. Who on earth had Chloe provoked? Dad, what's going on? Anne had also chased after them. Shaking his head, David took out his phone and made a call to the Harper family. His expression was completely dissociated. I don't know yet, but I have to inform the Harper family first. The Harper family had entrusted Chloe to the Smith family, but now that such a thing had happened, David couldn't possibly hide it from them. Bessie had to stay in the hospital for observation for another day and would be discharged tomorrow afternoon. Mayor Grant and Scarlett were both there right now. In the ward, Paul and Mary were afraid that Bessie would let her imagination run wild, so they had stayed behind. Simons was afraid that these people wouldn't know the severity of her inquiries, so he had specially brought a family doctor to take care of her, even though it was a VIP ward and was more spacious than a normal ward. It was still slightly crowded because of all the people inside. Left hand? Mayor Grant didn't sit and just flipped through Bessie's report. He looked at her plastered left hand and felt a little relieved. It's a blessing in disguise. She should recover at ease. There's no need to worry about other things. Mayor Grant lowered his eyebrows and concealed his anger. Whoever it was that dared to target Bessie's hand, he would let them sit in prison. Paul and the others didn't know what Mayor Grant was thinking, but when they heard him, they couldn't help but exchange glances. Bessie had hurt her left hand but it was a blessing in disguise. She couldn't even take her final exams. Scarlett still had short hair. She waited for the others to finish talking, and after thinking for a moment, said quietly, "'Can you guys go out for a while? I want to tell Bessie something privately.' 
After seeing Bessie's injury, Mayor Grant had heaved a sigh of relief and was in the mood to take care of other things now. Thus, he nodded and took out his phone to call Officer Gomez. Paul and the others also went out. As soon as they had left, Mary went to close the door. As she did, she saw Thomas coming over from the elevator entrance. Mr. Grant. Thomas had a good relationship with Jacob and had also seen Mayor Grant several times. Although he knew that Bessie knew Mayor Grant, he was still shocked to see him at her door and immediately greeted him politely. Holding his phone, Mayor Grant glanced at him and nodded slightly. Then he remembered something. It's just you? Thomas pursed his lips. At the thought of Grace's attitude at the dining table, he was unable to find words to reply to him. If Anne had been the one injured, Grace would have already rushed over, right? In his silence, Mayor Grant could also guess the situation. His eyes were full of ridicule as he said, Come and take a look at Bessie, but wait a minute. Scarlet is still talking to her inside. Even though he tried the whole afternoon, David failed to contact the Harper family in Evanston. He had called Larry to find out about Chloe, but to no avail. It seemed like there wasn't the tiniest bit of movement in the entirety of Chicago, so David was a bundle of nerves. It wasn't until the next day, on the morning of June 6th, that he received a call from the Harper family. Chloe's father's voice sounded very tired. David, the Harper family is over. David's expression changed greatly. How is that possible? Is it because of Chloe? After Larry's words yesterday, he had already felt like things weren't as simple as they seemed. He was on eggshells and hadn't slept well at night. I don't know. I heard that she was involved in a premeditated murder case and offended an important person in Chicago. The Harper Corporation was seized overnight. I've contacted countless people in Evanston and have yet to find out who she's offended. If I know who it is, there might be a ray of hope. Without even showing their face, the other party had directly squashed the Harper family. The people related to this case didn't dare to even reveal the last name. So Chloe's father had no clue who Chloe had offended. Premeditated murder? David instantly thought of Bessie's car accident yesterday. He knew that Bessie knew Samuel and Rick. He held on to this information and stood up directly. His voice was very heavy as he said, If that's the case, I think I know who she is offended. David briefly explained Bessie's situation to him. Aunt Ruth, go and call Grace to come down. David hung up the phone. Aunt Ruth went upstairs to call Grace. As she came downstairs, she happened to receive a call from Mr. Harper. His voice over the phone was kind and flattering, which made her feel bewildered. Grace and the Harper family had been in an awkward relationship, but because of Anne, the Harper family had started getting closer to Grace and the others recently. Anne was almost helpless in Evanston and mostly relied on the Perez and Harper families. In the past, Grace didn't even have the qualifications to listen to the Harper family's affairs. Who knew that there would be a day when Chloe's father and the Harper family would beg her so humbly? She answered the phone in astonishment. Then, she went upstairs to get her bag and glanced at David. Let's go. Originally, Chloe thought she would be interrogated or tortured. She had even prepared her excuses. However... There was nothing. Instead of questioning or torturing her, they locked her up in an empty cell. In the afternoon and evening each day, these people would hand her some bread and a glass of water through the small window. Chloe didn't have her phone or a watch. She didn't know how much time had passed or whether it was time for her final exams. Her original calm composure finally cracked. She started slapping the door and shouting like crazy. She even threatened to sue them. When her voice became hoarse from shouting, someone opened the door and took her to the interrogation room. There was only one table and two chairs in the interrogation room. The chairs were placed on opposite sides of the table. Chloe saw Bessie sitting on one of the chairs. Why are you here? Her eyes flashed involuntarily when she saw her left hand. This was the only thing that made her happy after being locked up for so long. 
It seemed like Bessie really couldn't take her final exams after all. You racked your brains for a scheme to target my left hand, all to prevent me from taking my final exams? Bessie spun a pen with her right hand and leaned against the back of the chair. She raised an eyebrow, her face still cold and indifferent. Chloe didn't reply. She calmed herself down and sat down opposite her. I don't know what you're talking about. Bessie smiled. Without speaking, she picked up a pen with her right hand and in front of Chloe wrote down a line in the notebook. Episode 220 She's Not Left-Handed Without speaking, Bessie picked up a pen with her right hand and wrote a line on the notebook. Chloe looked down stiffly, staring in shock at the words. After staying in Brightbow High School for so long, she had heard many things about Bessie. For example, the rumors that she was left-handed and that her handwriting wasn't very nice. But now, she stared at the words on the paper. The strokes were steady and the handwriting stance was without restraint. It was nothing like what she had heard in the rumors. She stood up abruptly from her chair, her whole body stiff and her blood running cold. Bessie glanced at her and threw the pen on the table. She raised her head and smiled cheerfully. Sorry, but I'm not left-handed. This sentence was like thunder blasting through Chloe's mind. She stared at Bessie, her eyes turning dark and her body almost collapsing in shock. She had worked so hard just to prevent Bessie from going to the examination room tomorrow. While locked in here for one afternoon and night, the only comfort in her heart had been that Bessie wouldn't be able to take the exam since she had injured her left hand. After so many deliberations, never did she expect Bessie to be right-handed. Then, what was the point of racking her brain for all of those schemes? Five minutes later, someone came in and took her out while she was still in a daze. Halfway across the room, she finally returned to her senses and grabbed the policewoman's arm. Where's my phone? Give me my phone. I want to call my dad. The policewoman glanced at her without a word. Then she asked someone to hand Chloe's phone to her. Chloe stared at the time. One night and one afternoon had already passed. That was, the final exams hadn't started yet. With trembling fingers, she called her father. The phone was picked up after only one ring, and Chloe quickly explained her situation to her father. Dad, I'm now... In her eyes, Bessie had no way of dealing with the car accident, but now she had started panicking. Chloe. Chloe's father's voice sounded very old. I've already asked your uncle to beg Bessie. If she's willing, we can settle this privately, but if not, you can only go to jail. Privately? Beg Bessie? As if she had just heard a joke, her lips curled up in a sneer. Dad, who are you kidding? Why do we need to beg her? She's just an orphan girl who has nothing. The Smith family and Anne won't even help her. Orphan? Chloe's father was silent for a moment. He was now waiting for David's answer and didn't even have the strength to scold his daughter. An orphan girl can make the Harper family the subject of an investigation. Chloe, I've already warned you a long time ago not to be too conceited. You can only pray for your uncle to help us now. Otherwise, I won't be able to save you. When Bessie left the police station, Michael was waiting for her at the door. Marvin's car was parked outside. Michael first opened the car on the left to let Bessie enter, before going around to the right side. Samuel sat in the passenger seat, leaning lazily against the door. He put his hand on the back of the seat and turned to raise an eyebrow at Bessie. Why did you go to visit Chloe? Michael unscrewed the lid of the thermos cup and handed it to her. She took a sip and answered casually. No reason. I just gave her a gift. Okay. Michael reluctantly accepted her answer. He turned around, fastened his seatbelt, and let Marvin drive the car back to the hospital. Bessie had originally had a comprehensive physical examination scheduled at 9 o'clock in the morning, but because she wanted to visit Chloe all of a sudden, they had all compromised. Hence, Marvin had driven the car over early in the morning. Now, they were going back to continue the physical examination. 
When they arrived at the hospital, Michael went to find the doctor, while Samuel and Marvin accompanied Bessie to the 28th floor. Talking to someone at the door of the ward, Simons immediately turned back when he heard the elevator door. He said in a happy voice, Bessie, come here. Your mother has come to see you. He stepped to the side to reveal Grace and David behind him. At the sight of them, Samuel put his hands in his pockets and said indifferently, To what do we owe the pleasure of President Smith and Mrs. Smith's company? Standing behind Bessie, Marvin only frowned without speaking. Simons hadn't heard Marvin and the others talk about Bessie's parents. He hadn't specifically checked on Bessie's life either, so he had been very polite after finding out that Grace was her mother. But he could tell something was wrong after hearing Samuel's tone. He glanced calmly at Grace and David. Grace breathed a sigh of relief that Michael wasn't here. But after hearing Samuel, she felt a little awkward and reached out to touch her hair involuntarily, speechless for a while. Bessie, I've come with your mother to visit you. Is your hand okay? David's eyes fell on her left hand. She had a cast on it. David's heart sank. It's fine. Bessie glanced at them and raised an eyebrow. She didn't expect Grace to visit her. Let's go inside and not loiter around. Samuel stepped forward and lifted his chin, instructing Simons to open the door. He took Bessie inside. Outside, Grace felt a little uncomfortable and glanced at David. Frowning, David stared at Bessie's back and pondered for a moment. After a long while, he nodded slightly. The two of them went in. Simons and Marvin were still outside the door. Simons closed the door of the ward and didn't enter immediately. Instead, he walked over to Marvin and asked in a low voice, What's the matter with Bessie's mother, Samuel? Bessie's mother has never cared for her. Marvin glanced at the door and lowered his voice. Yesterday, even Thomas came after receiving the news, but her mother didn't come. She must have ulterior motives for coming here today. Simons narrowed his eyes and turned back to the door of the ward. Inside, Grace stood in the middle of the room awkwardly, not knowing what to say. She just weakly asked Bessie a few questions about her hand. Samuel sat on the sofa in the ward, playing games and ignoring Grace and David. Smiling, Simons walked in and brought chairs for Grace and David to sit on. He also politely poured a cup of tea for each of them. David sat down and took a sip of tea from the teacup. He pursed his lips and hesitated for a moment before saying, Bessie, did the doctor say how long your hand will take to recover? Two to four weeks. Bessie sat down on the other side of the table and casually clasped her fingers on it. Then she really couldn't take her final exams. Pressing his eyebrows, David put down the teacup and stood up. He bowed in front of Bessie. Bessie, I have only just found out about Chloe. I feel very ashamed as well. Although I'm aware that what she did wasn't right, I still hope you can forgive her this time. I will give her a lecture and send her abroad so she'll never return to America ever again. I hope you can forgive her this time. Bessie leaned back in her chair and listened. She supported her chin with her uninjured hand and smiled casually, not in the least bit surprised. She had already guessed as much. Why would Grace care about whether her hand was injured before her final exams? After seeing her smile and looking less sharp than before, Grace breathed a sigh of relief. Yes, Bessie, since you took half a year off school, final exams aren't of much use to you anyway. It doesn't matter if you can't take the exam this year. I'll find a good summer class for you. Grace's words came out smoothly. David sat beside her, frowning at her words, but not interrupting her. Simons had been standing at the side with a smile. There was always a smile on his old, kind face, and he had been considerably respectful to Grace and David. However, after hearing this, his smile gradually faded. Bessie held her chin with one hand and said with an indifferent expression, And? Chloe is still young. So she was confused for a moment. Grace took a deep breath. Tomorrow is the final exams. If she has a criminal record because of this, what will happen to her future? Have you ever thought about how you might ruin someone else's life? 
Before she could finish speaking, Samuel, who had been playing games on the sofa, couldn't suppress his anger anymore. He smashed his phone suddenly and exploded. Then have you thought about what would happen to our Bessie if she can't take her finals? Have you thought about whether there will be any residual effects on her hand? I thought you found your conscience and came to see her, but it seems like I overestimated you. Do you think we're so easy to bully and nobody is covering us? Thank God Bessie didn't live with the Smith family in the beginning. Otherwise, we don't know how badly she would be treated. You've come to beg us to forgive Chloe? In your dreams. Samuel sneered and opened his mouth. Marvin, come in and get rid of these two. Marvin had been standing outside when he heard Samuel's voice. He opened the door of the ward and directly walked to Grace. The door of the ward was originally half-closed, and Marvin's five senses were all sensitive, so he had also heard Grace's words. At this moment, he stared at Grace very coldly. At the same time, two people in black came to drag Grace out. Their movements were simple and rude. Grace didn't expect Bessie to stay silent, so she looked at her incredulously. She didn't expect Bessie to allow others to treat her like that either. Bessie, how could you? Bessie reached out for the glass of water that Simons handed her. She smiled widely and said, Ma'am, it sounds like you found the wrong person. She was smiling, but her tone was unruly as always, and the bottom of her eyes was boundlessly dark. Grace felt a shiver run down her spine at this moment. After Bertha's death, she had already felt like Bessie was a little different. But today... Her perception was even clearer. Towards strangers, Bessie also used this kind of perfunctory and unruly attitude. When had she become like this? Episode 2